All right, welcome to episode two of the Carnism Debunked podcast. Uh, joining me today is Laith Malik Reem, a self professed ethicist and antinatalist, and Jack, who many of you will know as the vegan YouTuber Humane Hancock, whose recent focus on wild animal suffering and human intervention is definitely a thought provoking topic. So I wanted to get these two together today with me to discuss these philosophies and how they may relate. Uh, so, firstly, welcome to the show, Laith. Thank you, George. Uh, so happy to be with you here on this podcast. Honor to have you on, mate, and welcome to the show, Jack. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So, Laith, I just wanted to start with you. Now, many of our listeners will be familiar with antinatalism, which is a moral stance against human procreation, not only due to the suffering and impact humans cause to others by existing, but also due to the guaranteed suffering caused to the person uh, merely by existing. So essentially the notion that it's better to never exist at all. But what exactly is ethilism and does it differ in any way from antinatalism? Yes, sure. So first of all, uh, let me uh, define ethilism. What is ethilism? The word itself. So the word ethilism, it's E-F-I-L-I-S-M. Ethel comes from life itself, but it's spelled backwards. Mm. And, uh, well, we know that uh, veganism, for example, is uh, trying to reduce suffering as much as possible. Antinatalism as well is trying to reduce suffering as much as possible. But the difference between antinatalism and ethelism is that ethelism is eliminating suffering itself going to the root of the problem and eliminating suffering itself. So this is the goal of aphelism. It's a philosophy. Okay. And Jack, um, can you tell us what exactly the work is that you've been doing recently with your focus on wild animal suffering and essentially what your goal is here with the whole thing? Sure, sure. So I guess where to start. I mean, I've, I've been an animal rights advocate for many years. And over the last year now, I've become interested in wild animal suffering. And really, I mean, we tend to romanticize the lives of animals. I think we all kind of do that. Wild animals, I mean, uh, we think they have, well, we, we watch documentaries like David Attenborough documentaries, and we, we expect that they have these kind of majestic, beautiful lives. Um, I kind of looked into this and I found out that we have reason to believe that the lives of most wild animals are largely filled with misery. Um, so the, the first question is whether we should do something to help them if we can. Um, my position is that what I ultimately care about, the reason I'm a vegan activist is because I care about suffering. I want there to be less unpleasant experiences in the world and I see no reason to make a moral distinction between the suffering of an animal in the wild and the suffering of a domesticated animal. Uh, the, the second question is what, if anything, can we do about it? Um, and that's more of a, a tricky question for me. And I actually have a video that I'm working on at the moment to talk about the, the possible approaches to reducing wild animal suffering. From my perspective, what I've been doing up to this point uh, with my work on wild animal suffering is to raise awareness really about how bad it is because it's such a neglected topic. Uh, nobody really seems to be talking about this. Uh, and as I said, since I care about suffering, if we think about the suffering that exists in the world today, well, suffering in the wild experienced by individuals living in the wild is probably the most suffering on the planet. Um, so, yeah, as I said, I'm trying to raise awareness about it. And that's kind of what I've been doing up to this point. In terms of what we can do about it, as I said, it's more tricky. I think the first point is kind of to emphasize that we, we can't expect to have solutions to a problem that's barely been investigated. You know, if, if we never began to research malaria, we would never have created malaria nets. We'd never have worked out ways to reduce the suffering caused by this disease. So I don't think it makes sense to um, sort of step away from or, or to stop exploring the topic further simply because we haven't got the answer. I think the, the, the answer is to, to look into this more. Yeah. Now, Laith, going off what Jack has said just there, would you describe Jack as an ethicist? Yes, kind of, because uh, he cares about uh, wild animal suffering. And uh, the, the thing is that being an ethicist is being against the uh, having, having children for humans and for non-humans, yeah. both of them. 
So if the, if Jack is also against animals breeding animals and uh, animals having uh, offspring in the wild, so yeah, he would surely be an aphilist. Yeah. Now, Jack, is is, is Laith right there when he specifies about the um, with your stance on wild animal suffering? Is it right that you don't want wild animals to procreate, or is it something else that you? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. So um, I think where, I mean, I, I got to sort of qualify this by saying I don't know much about ethelism. In fact, mm. I didn't really know what it was until you asked me on for this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm looking forward to, to hearing That's why I've about. got Laith in, because uh, yeah, people, yeah. people don't know what it means. And I, I think it's good to have him on so we can talk more about it. But ca sorry, but, carry on what you're saying. Yeah, where I think um, I'll agree with Laith is that suffering is what matters. And we both want to reduce the amount of suffering in the world um where perhaps i differ and I, mean, I could be wrong when i say this but am i right in saying that ethelis wants to abolish all life because that's not a position that i've taken yes that's right but we do not call for this in a in a in a very bad way we 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 just for example ask people if if there's a red button where you can press this red button and and everything and the whole life would you do that mm -hmm. because because we know that life is based on needs like we all have needs whether humans or animals and these needs are unnecessary and to satisfy yourself and fulfill yourself with these needs is sometimes very difficult to happen so the problem is that once we are alive we are consumers we know that we are consumers and to be happy, you need to put someone else in a negative state of being. For example, if I want to eat a burger, I'm vegan, but just to, to say that, uh, if I want to eat a burger full of animal flesh, a cow has to be in a negative state of being for me to get this pleasure. And, and that happens between animals as well in the wild. Uh, if we want to compare lions to deer, for example, uh, there's a prey and a predator always. So this is, this is the whole problem about life, that it's about winning and losing, winning and losing, and for unnecessary reasons. Yeah, there, there uh, was a, a video. Sorry, yeah. go, go on, Laith. What, finish what you're going to say. So, so, sorry to interrupt you, but imagine the life of a zebra, for example. A life of a zebra, he spends his whole life uh, running away from uh, carnivores yeah. and uh, eating grass. Uh, like, this doesn't make any sense. So that's why we feel for these animals. We feel for everyone who suffers. And that's why we call for a sixth mass extinction. Because, so, yeah, I, I was so going to say... Go on, Jack. Go on, <laughs> all right, all right. So, so recently, Leif, I saw you share a video that was called something like Gladiator War. What, what is that analogy? What is Gladiator War with relation to wild animal suffering? Because I think this would be cool for Jack to hear about as, as well. Yes, sure. So, so first of all, let me just uh, tell the ones who are listening to this podcast to check uh, Gary Amandum. He's, he's a very good speaker for Ethelism on YouTube. You can find him on YouTube. Also, there's a very good friend of mine, one of the greatest people that I know. Her name is Amanda Oldfan Sukinik. Uh, her YouTube channel is Forever Will Films, where they talk about this in details. Uh, about the gladiator war, the thing is that we're, we're in this battlefield for no reason we didn't ask for this whether mm. animals or humans no one asked to be born and once we're born we have to fight in order to survive if you do not fight you cannot survive because life is based on survival of the fittest survival of the strongest so, so this is the the worst thing about it this is the thing that uh leaves it with, with oppressors and oppressed ones so we always have oppressors and we always have oppressed ones no matter what we do in this life because that's how life is itself nature yeah. is itself like that it's bloody it's not beautiful 
people say nature is beautiful, but I do not find it beautiful. Maybe it's covered with yeah. a beautiful, uh, <laughs> you know, the trees and so on. It looks the, picturesque. The Greenland. Yeah. Yeah, it looks sure. beautiful. But but if you look at it deep inside and you see how animals kill each other, how humans kill each other, how mm. humans kill animals, it's it's ugly. sick. It's bloody. Yeah. It's ugly. And uh, that's 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 what we are trying to fight and that's what we are trying to show people to spread awareness um by so, by not contributing to this sure so i think we can all agree that there's a lot of suffering in the world both experienced by humans and non-humans but just thinking about this pragmatically i mean the idea of promoting extinction of all life i mean do you think this is ever something that could come to be because from my perspective um where perhaps we differ is that i don't think it's a very pragmatic message i don't think it's something that's ever going to be taken on board um and that's why i feel acknowledging that there's a lot of suffering in the world i'm not going to jump to the conclusion that we should promote extinction i'm going to jump to the conclusion that we should try to reduce the suffering in ways that people are going to become on board with I was just going to say, Jack, um, if you're saying that this is ultimately sort of fruitless, what, why is it that you've decided to focus on wild animal suffering more recently and not, say, domesticated animal suffering like pigs and cows and sheep, which we can way more directly now do something about with our own money? I, so I don't think that it is fruitless to attempt to reduce wild animal suffering in fact, I think because it's so neglected, I think there's a, a huge scope for improvement in this area. But that's not to say that I'm no longer going to promote the um, promote veganism. My, my primary focus is still promoting veganism. But I feel like because there's so much area for improvement in this space, because nobody's talking about it, it makes sense for me to allocate some of my resources to, to working in this area too. Yeah. And what was... Um, recently, you did a video not calling out, but speaking to Earthling Ed, didn't you? You did a video saying, Earthling Ed, we need to talk. What was it that Ed said that you disagreed with? Yeah, so, I mean, firstly, I guess I'd, I'd state that there's a lot that we agree on. I mean, yeah. primarily, we're both working in the same area, and it certainly wasn't uh, a call-out video, you know, although, I mean, I understand how the title could be seen as a bit clickbaity, and you might think it is before you click on the you, video. You, a clickbaity title? Ben <laughs> Hancock? <laughs> so um but yeah i really admire and respect ed and, and everything he's done and yeah i think he cares a lot about the ecosystem and the environment and i think that's that that can be great but i what i try to point out in the video is that ed and other vegans as well we seem to neglect wild animals and we seem to focus on the species as a whole rather than the experience of the individual we talk yeah. about conserving animals, making sure there's enough species, uh, uh, making sure they're not going extinct, all this kind of stuff, rather than thinking about what can we actually do to make their lives better or asking the question, what is their lives like? Is it a pleasant life? Is it worth living? Is it something that we'd want to be born into? Yeah, because you know what? I I'll tell both of you straight up now, this is something I've had a lot of cognitive dissonance over recently. And I think I even shot you a message a while back about it actually, Leith is that when I watch documentaries like Cowspiracy, it's like, I don't know what, it's, it's like I want to agree with the message and go, yeah, save all these species, save the rainforest and stuff like that. But then it's like, why, why would I want that? If life is like such torturous hell in nature, and it is, why would I, why would I be against species extinction, for example? And, I do, and this is one, of, I, I'm even considering almost like taking it out of my, outreach so to speak you know when we say to people if they come with the environmental arguments against veganism we say no actually uh, veganism is really great for species extinction and stuff like that and it's like why should i be against species extinction if it's better for so many creatures you know never to have existed and i i, I wanted to get your thoughts on that Leith, because you said you want a mass extinction do you feel that that violates vegan principles in any way or do you think that goes hand in hand with veganism to want extinction to happen um yes george uh, that's a very good point to mention uh 
I, I think that it goes hand in hand with veganism because veganism uh, should be for animal rights. Yeah. Not for environmental issues, not for health issues. So yeah. about the environment, like we know what's going on in the environment. We know that species are going extinct and I feel happy for anyone who goes extinct because they do not suffer anymore. They do not have to worry about anything anymore. They have no needs anymore. So they will just rest in peace away from this terrible life and terrible nature. So um, do you cheer if a species goes extinct? Of course. You know, yeah, because I see all the vegan posts. Like, oh, no, the, the snow leopard's going extinct. And oh, no, the so-and-so has gone extinct. What do you, how do you react when you see that? But what's... Yeah. I, I feel happy because what's the point of keeping them? Why do you want to keep them? Why do you want to keep them to suffer, to, to experience yeah. hunger, to experience pain, to experience uh, body decay, to experience uh, losing someone uh, from their family members, for example, or being uh, injured because of the uh, natural disasters or because of other animals. And, you know, the fights remain always. And uh, we athletes think that life is crap. And crap is an abbreviation of uh, consumption, reproduction, addiction, and parasitism. Wow, so, yeah. That's a good acronym to remember. Yeah, it's... It, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so let me start with the first uh, letter C, which is consumption. We are all consumers, whether we are animals or humans, we consume. And... Uh, if you do not consume, you're, you're not alive anymore. And we all reproduce, we all appropriate, unfortunately. But the difference between us and animals is that animals are not aware of what they're doing. Like they're, they have this instinct where they want to have sex, but they're not aware of the consequences. They do not know that they're going to procreate, for example, and they do not think about it. But we know, we know for sure that once we procreate that child for example is gonna suffer so mm. that's why we have this responsibility to spread awareness for antinatalism and athelism in general now being an antinatalism doesn't mean that you're an athelist because you know there's a lot of organizations like the vamped if you heard about it before no I haven't voluntary yeah, voluntary human extinction. Ah, uh, I have. Yeah, uh, yeah. These people, yeah, these people call only for human extinction, and uh, they think that if humans went extinct, then life would be amazing and so beautiful for other animals. But that doesn't make any sense because I personally think that if we go extinct, only humans, yeah. then another species will conquer the whole world and another species will will do what we do to animals nowadays yeah that's what i think because that that's how life is i I actually see a bit of an inconsistency in a lot of vegans because we want as vegans for domesticated animals to go extinct right you know when carnists say oh you vegans uh you know if if it if you had it your way the animal you know pigs and cows and sheep wouldn't even exist and we say well that's what we want we don't want these animals to exist in this world they should have never existed in the first place why do we only say that to pigs and chickens and cows but we don't say that about the snow leopard like, do you see, Jack, do you see a bit of an inconsistency there as well? Or do you think that you can want wild animals to, uh, to exist, but not domesticated animals? Good question. Um, I think you can. I, I don't think there's necessarily a consistency there. I mean, someone could be vegan because they think that farmed animals tend to have extremely terrible lives and they don't want to fund the suffering And it could be the case that you think it's possible that some wild animals could have good lives. Um, And therefore you could be interested in trying to reduce wild animal suffering as opposed to, to making them extinct. I guess there's lots of also, there's also lots of interesting philosophical questions regarding where our obligations lie, whether we should be going in and intervening and altering the lives of of non-humans as opposed to simply just not causing harm which i think that's where a lot of vegans fall i think a lot of vegans are interested in 
not causing harm to animals, but they want uh, nature to be left alone. Yeah. Um, from, from my perspective, if we've got two individuals that are suffering and we equalize that suffering, let's say um, one of these animals, animal A, their, their suffering is being caused by humans and animal B, their suffering is being caused by uh, something natural like disease. For me, I, I can't see any reason to uh, distinguish between the two. I think both of their experiences matter equally because the suffering is equalized. Um, and I think it would be a coin flip to decide which one we should help if we only have the opportunity to help one. Um, the reason I care, the reason I'm vegan is that I care about animals and I don't only care about domesticated animals. You know, I care about wild as well. But to go back to your question, um, I'm not promoting um, the extinction of wild animals. Uh, and one of the, the reasons for that is because, like I said, and I'd kind of be interested to get Leith's position on this, is that pragmatically, I don't think that message is going to lead to the outcomes that you want. I don't think that it's pragmatically possible to convince the world to make themselves and non-human life extinct. Yeah, but but I, I think that I think that it's the same when someone says like it's pragmatically not possible to promote veganism or to promote antinatalism because why not? Uh, we know that it's almost impossible to change the whole world, for example, but we try our <laughs> best and that's our duty, that's our moral obligation so, because of what's happening in this world. With uh, veganism, I guess I disagree that it's not pragmatically possible to create a vegan world. I think with um, the release of in vitro meat, when, when that's developed and available en masse, I very much expect factory farming to end. And if I had to guess, I'd say that that's going to happen within the next 50 to 100 years, if not earlier. Um, so yeah, I think there, is, there are things we can do about that. With, with antinatalism though, I do think you can make a pretty strong argument that it may be the, the end goal, if, if the end goal is extinction, you could make an argument that that's futile. I mean, if you just think about the fact, you know, we know how selection pressure works. If, the, if people decide not to have children, their genes don't continue. And the ones who do want to have children, their genes do continue. So you kind of have a future of people who want to have kids. <laughs> you know, that's kind of how selection pressure works. Um, so I think that that could be a, a strong argument against antinatalism, at least if your goal, if the goal of antinatalism is extinction. So yeah, that's a very good, that's a very good um, topic of discussion, actually. It's like, if we want extinction of other species because of the pain and suffering um, that they go through, should we, yeah, not want there to be more humans to drive that extinction or do you, so, so, I was going to ask you later, does that violate antinatalism in some way that you want animal species to go extinct, but you'd also wish for humans to stop procreating? Um, is there a bit of a conflict there or do you think you can promote them both at the same time? I think you can promote them both at the same time. It's, it's easy to promote them both at the same time. Uh, on a personal level, you cannot do anything as an ethicist uh, to stop to 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 let the world go extinct for example yeah but you can do as an antinatalist and as a vegan because once you stop procreating or once you stop consuming animal products then it's it's as simple as that and yeah. you can preach it easily but, uh, we... but regarding ethicism it's different yeah i was going to say if we stop procreating as a species does that mean there'll be more wild animals? Because think humans are the biggest blight on this planet, right? The amount of harm that we cause. If Surely if humans stop procreating, does that mean that there'll be more wild animal suffering because more wild animals will flourish? Or I, I don't know. This this is definitely something uh, yes, that yes. also... I, I... <laughs> yeah, sorry to interrupt you. I, I, un I understand what you mean. So... Yeah. Yes, I think I think th this is a little bit uh, difficult. There's a conflict here because yeah. the more we procreate as humans, the more we're going to let other species go extinct. But at the same time, we're going to uh, inflict uh, this pain uh, to other humans and uh, by procreating them in the first place. Yeah. So this is this is going to be a mess like it's it's we're going nowhere by 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 doing so 
and you cannot really you cannot really guarantee that uh everyone would would go extinct by procreating more and more because yeah. you know there's millions of species of insects millions of species of uh animals and uh it's it's not that easy yeah you cannot guarantee it one thing though i guess if we did stop procreating as a species is that at least we would wipe out um animal agriculture and i think that has the most suffering i don't, I don't know if jack would agree with me on this actually would you would you say jack that wild animals actually suffer more than like pigs and chickens so i don't know about whether any individual suffers more than pigs or chickens but what i would say is there will be more suffering overall in the wild than there are in farmed animals and that's because the sheer numbers of wild animals is unimaginable yeah even if you don't include invertebrates i mean it's just incredible the, the number of animals living in the wild so that's what as i that's why i said in terms of suffering overall suffering wild animal suffering is the biggest issue on the planet and interestingly I kind of, as I started looking into this, I kind of saw wild animal suffering as perhaps an argument against antinatalism, because if antinatalists want humans to become extinct, then the suffering in the wild may go on indefinitely. I think it's, mm. I think a lot of vegans tend to have an anti-human view of the world. And when I thought about Guilty. wild animal suffering, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when I thought about wild animal suffering, I started to think about how how lucky it is that. In this universe of just replicators, seen this, this meaningless suffering that seems to be happening in, uh, due to natural selection by evolution, yeah. we've developed the cognitive capacity to actually start making the world better. You know, we can value well-being and we can actually start shaping the world so it's better, like we have done for human beings. I mean, you know, it's good that we've got hospitals. It's good that we've got schools. It's good that we've got homes to live in. It's quite amazing that by some chance we are here and we can actually start making the world better because this suffering in, in nature, these wild animals have been suffering for millions of years. This has been yeah. going on, you know, and yeah, so it's kind of in, in a way, even though the, the topic seems very depressing and negative, you're talking about suffering, but in a way it's kind of making me feel a bit more positively about humanity because we have the potential to really make this place better. Mm. So, cause you get a lot of criticism, don't you? People say, Jack, why are you trying to play God and all this stuff? Like, what, what do you say to all those people who say, why are you trying to play God? Yeah, um, I think it's, it's an interesting argument to make. I mean, I think that we already do play God, as I said, when it comes to alleviating human suffering. Yeah. Are we playing God when we treat a child for having a broken leg? You could probably say so, I guess. Are we, are we playing God when we treat people for cancer? Could you We're imagine playing... that someone bursting into the hospital... Why are you trying to play God as someone's exactly. dying in the hospital bed? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting how, as individuals, we expect to be shielded from all of the naturally occurring suffering in the world, but people seem to be simultaneously unwilling to extend that to non-humans who suffer just like us. Yeah. And also, I wanted to speak about... Because um, I wanted to see what you value more, actually, Jack, out of intensity of suffering and scale of suffering because for me farmed animals have a greater intensity of suffering than wild animals that's just my opinion i don't you might disagree like you say the scale of wild animal suffering is much larger because there's all these insects all these all these um other free living animals but for me the pain that they go through while it is torturous i still don't think it's comparable to like a pig stuck in a gestation crate for a year or however long it is and bear bile farming when they're in the cages, you know, just for, for tw up to 20 years, like they'll stick a bear in a cage in the bear bile farming industry and stuff like that. Like, which do you think is, we should value more like the scale or the intensity? Yeah. A very good question. I guess I think there, there's some, I suppose, calculation to be made because I think we should care about both. Yeah. Um, we don't know enough about the lives of wild animals to, make, to take any confident stances on just how bad their lives are. And we're talking about so many different species here and so many different types of animals that it's likely to vary a lot. I think it could well be the case that farmed animals as individuals experience more intense suffering and more chronic suffering, I guess you could say, than yeah. many 
uh, wild animals. You know, I think that's why that's why I'm focusing so much on farmed animals because I think it's such a huge issue, and I think there is a we actually have the potential to completely abolish this. And I'm under no illusions that we're going to be helping wild animals to a significant level while we're still, you know, holocausting billions of animals. Yeah. At the same time, I mean, yeah, we need to stop harming animals without a doubt. I'm not sure. It's an interesting question. I'm, I'm really not sure. I don't think we know enough. And I, and I guess I'm not strong enough with my philosophy to, to, to know how we make this calculation between scale and intensity. Yeah. Now, Laith, if you could forcibly stop animals from procreating, if, if humans had a way to forcibly do this, would you think that was okay? Or would you think that violated veganism somehow? Like their bodily autonomy rights and all that kind of stuff. Like say, say we could, I don't know, painlessly castrate bears living in the wild, like shoot them with some kind of dart or something they don't even feel. Would you support that? Definitely, I would do that because uh, since it's painless, then that that wouldn't uh, be against veganism or be against animal rights because mm. you're doing so for the sake of the unborn, for the sake of the coming generations from that bear, for example. So once you do that, you you guarantee that there's uh, that that he's the end of the family line. Yeah. So his uh, yeah. family. Yeah. Same as spaying and neutering dogs and cats, right? Like, I think most vegans are in favor of that. So surely, would it be, would, would those vegans who are in favor of that, but not shooting bears with this dart that stopped them from procreating, would, would they be hypocritical in their stance, do you think? I, I think, I think it's uh, hypocritical, yes. Yeah. I think it's hypocritical to, because they're aware of what's happening. They're aware of their suffering. And and uh, I would like to say that also for humans, I would do that, not, not only for animals, just just to be uh, clear on this, because even humans, uh, like they're aware, they're, they should be responsible, but they're not, they're still procreating, they're still breeding in large numbers, uh, even though, like y you, see, you see how is it going in 2020, you have the pandemic, you have a lot of problems economically, uh, socially, and so on. I'm still procreating. Yeah. So now I we think should we're... start with humans, I think, then, then we should move to animals. Yeah. And I think all three of us would unanimously agree here that it's morally preferable to adopt than to procreate. But how, how do we go about doing this in a way that's not completely authoritarian or do you think we need to be authoritarian about it like how, how would you go about sterilizing humans in a way that wasn't oppressive for example Laith? can i can i just quickly to go back to the the other question uh, that mm. we were just talking about um we were talking about you, you were asking Laith if it's ethical to um say put a dart into a bear that makes them sterile yeah. Um, I guess the thing I want to kind of stress is that I wouldn't be in favor of an intervention like that right now because mm. we're not very aware of the different knock-on effects of that, how it would affect the ecology, how it would affect other animals. And we just don't know what the outcome would be. But like theoretically speaking, would I be in favor if we had the research to know that it would make a, a positive impact to the well-being of animals overall? Uh, then yes, I would. And I, I think like the the consent argument is interesting because, of course, the, the animals being born into that world aren't consenting either. And with all the starvation that occurs because there's so many individuals competing for resources, well, the animals aren't consenting to that. So there's, like, either way you look at it, the animals aren't consenting uh, to what's happening to them. You know? um, and of course, as yeah. you said, with, pet, with pets, we, we do sterilize them. Um, and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of animals who are being killed in shelters because these shelters can't keep up with how many unwanted animals there are. So, yeah, I can only hope that the people making this consent argument aren't adopting pets and, you know, um, and letting them breed. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. I strongly agree with Jack here. Yeah. And, and on that um, human notion of procreation, like how, how could we go about doing that in a way that wasn't, oppressive and authoritarian like because we could we can advise people look there's children in need of adoption 
um, why continue to procreate, for example? But how could we actually go about enforcing that in a way that wasn't oppressive? I don't think you can. <laughs> yeah, that's the... <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe you need, you need uh, some people who are expert in this by putting something, a material in the water, for example, that you drink. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> by the time the, you drink it, you become sterilized. It's like an antinatalist terror attack. I can just sort of see like late sneaking into the water supply at night with a balaclava on and just dropping this thing into the water. And <laughs> the next day, the whole population is just unable to procreate or something. Because maybe this is the, <laughs> like, this is the, uh, the only way where you cannot really harm them, where yeah. you do not really harm them physically, maybe if, if they're, <laughs> yeah and and jack i wanted to get your thoughts on antinatalism we speak about it all the time but and i know your um your philosophy on it seems to be sort of ever changing like do you, <laughs> do you think like that we should be advising humans not to procreate also because I, I know you say you say you would agree with shooting the bear with the dart if we could to stop the the bear cubs being born into a world of suffering do you think we should yeah. be advocating antinatalism as well? Yeah, so I, as you said, my, my position on antinatalism seems to, to, to swing back and forth. Yeah. Um, I, at the moment, I'd probably describe myself as a soft antinatalist. Yeah. Uh, and I do so because I, I don't really think that, in my personal opinion, I don't think we're justified to bring more suffering into the world. I'm not planning on having children. But at the same time... Um, I think humanity has the potential to create an amazing world. And I think we have the potential to help wild animals to an incredible extent one day. Uh, so I don't want humans to be extinct. See, the pessimist uh, in me says that we don't have the potential to create an amazing world. I, like, I, I can't ever see for as long as humans existing on this planet, I cannot ever envisage a world free of oppression. Even if some countries did it, there would still be other countries that um, that would continue doing it. Like, can you see, I don't know, Saudi Arabia, like not stoning women or something like that, even in like 200 years time or. But the thing is, if you go back far enough, I mean, we were behaving in similar ways in, yeah. in Britain. You know, if you go back far enough, things do seem to be changing the circle of moral expansion seems to be expanding constantly. I mean, how long? It wasn't that long ago where gay people didn't have the right to get married. Uh, black people have been enslaved. I mean, we seem to be giving more rights to more sentient beings <laughs> as time goes on. Yeah. Um, so I hope that wild animals will be included. Do you think Jack is being too optimistic there, Leith? What do you think? Yes, I call it optimism bias. I'm sorry, Jack, but that's what I that's how I see it. Wipe that smile off your face, Jack. <laughs> because... And start admitting your life is shit. Okay, okay, let me let me say this then. Let's let's assume let's assume, start admitting my life is shit. <laughs> um let's assume that we're never going to create the perfect world that I want. Mm. The thing is, even if you even said perfect there, though. Obviously, per perfection. It's like, are you not kind of like denouncing your own argument there? Why? Well, because we all want a perfect world, but we can't have a perfect world. Perfect is not possible, right? A perfect world is surely not I don't possible. know what will be possible in the future. Uh, <laughs> I've been um, reading me, a bit. I, I just want to tell you, Jack, me and Laith want a perfect world as well. <laughs> I think the difference <laughs> no, is... You you're evil. <laughs> <laughs> I think the difference is that both of us would just say we can't have one. Okay, let's, let's say... Like I'm imagining this future utopia where everyone's really happy and, and wild animals are really happy too. Let's say this wasn't this wasn't possible. Mm. The thing is, as I, I this is what this is a point that I'm really interested to get Leith's thoughts on, and that's the the argument from selection. So if people like us decide not to have children, and you know our genes die out, the people who do have children, their genes spread, and so you know by definition, the future is going to be. This future is going to have people who want to have children and the ones who don't want to have children will simply die out. I just can't see a way 
for antinatalism to reach an end goal of extinction ever. And if that's, the, if, that's the case, if that's the case, it seems like the best we can do is accept that maybe we can tr try to reduce the number of people being born, but we've got to accept mm. that, it, that the, the world is going to continue for human beings and we might as well try and do what we can to make the future better for them. But that's one of those personal responsibility things like veganism, right? Like us three here, we don't buy animal products, but we know... Because otherwise it sounds too much like the carnist argument when they say people are always going to eat meat. And, you know, oh, me going vegan won't make a difference. People are, are still going to do it. I, maybe that's the same with antinatalism, no? But the difference is that I'm talking about a selection pressure. Yeah. We know that um, the, genes that in, the genes and behaviours that increase the probability of reduc reproduction will um, propagate through <clears throat> a population. Um, and so what I'm saying is that if the antinatalists decide not to have kids... Well, even if, there's, even if there was 1% of the population who disagreed with you, their genes would continue and human race still wouldn't end. It's still going to be there. Yeah. But I mean, this is the thing, Laith, you mentioned earlier, the big red button. Yes, we'd probably press that if, if we had the opportunity to. I, I would press the red button, is my answer to, to that question earlier. But I still think we can just do things individually to reduce our harm while we actually do exist. And I think it's, you know, veganism, antinatalism, ethylism, they can't be perfect. But I guess it's just one of these, I just see them as a personal responsibility kind of thing. Again, this is just kind of the, the pessimist in me. I don't know if, Leith, you have the same sort of thoughts. Um, uh, I, I disagree that ethylism cannot be perfect because ethylism is about eliminating suffering itself. It's, not, it's about not having life in the first place not having yeah. needs not having any any other any other stuff and uh i'm wondering if uh, jack would press the red button i don't know uh, can you actually give me a definition of what this red button does <laughs> wipes, out <laughs> all, <laughs> wipes out all sentient life on the planet. all sentient yeah. life yeah. yeah all sentient life um, because as, as, as we said before, like, it's not possible to make everyone happy at the same time, because, uh, if you're going to be happy, then someone else has to be sad because it's, uh, on the expense of someone else, as I mentioned before, because that's how life is. It's, it's a battlefield. But is, is mm. that necessarily the case? And can you not envisage a future where that perhaps isn't the case? I mean, there are, <laughs> no. <laughs> like, For me, it's why, why would humans necessarily need to cause suffering to others to be happy? It's more that I think, I think generally the way the world works is that when someone is happy, it's, it's often at, at the expense of someone else somehow. Like when, when us three are sitting in our homes, for example, and we think, oh, this is nice, got this nice house or something. There's wild animals whose homes our houses were originally built on. Mm -hmm. I, I just can't see a world where like, like everything we do for pleasure, we're, as humans, we're pleasure seeking animals. Us three seek pleasure. A lot of these things do harm others in, in some way. When we watch our favorite movie or something like that, we're using electricity. Yeah. At the, at the moment, like a lot of what we do causes harm to others, but I guess I can, envisage a future where things could be better better yes but how how can we completely how can we create this like sort of like ideal world unless we have just extinction of everyone there will surely for as long as sentience exists unhappiness will always exist suffering will always exist do, would you guys think it's theoretically possible to eliminate suffering without extinction no it's 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 impossible for me because because I, I think that the problem is existential, not circumstantial. And there's there's a big difference between between these two issues. Like no matter how much the circumstances are better, the problem is existential because uh as I said before, like our body decays with time, we're gonna die at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why come up with someone who's going to die at the end? Like, 
it's inevitable. There's no other way where mm-hmm. you cannot save someone from dying because it, biologically, you know, your your body decays with time. And uh, I guess it's theoretically this is, possible. This, it's, it's theoretically possible that we have a future where people don't die. How? But that just sounds that just sounds crazy to me because then you just have <laughs> trillions of humans on the planet would be squished shoulder to shoulder. Well, I guess maybe by the time this happens, we will have expanded to other planets as well. <laughs> but I, I just can't see. I don't know, but it, I guess it just sounds too. It sounds way too far in the future. I don't know. It's, it would be very far in the future, yeah. Yeah, but I, I mean, even the thing with life on other planets, like how could we, how could we go to other planets without causing suffering to to species? Because we'd have to go to life breeding planets right in order to do that how could we actually go to those planets maybe well maybe we could just alter the environment on mars (laughs) (laughs) i mean yeah i guess that i I think that i guess like like, the point is like the the technology we'll have in the future will be far beyond our comprehension yeah like to us it would seem ridiculous just like the internet would seem ridiculous to someone living 300 years ago Mm. there'll be things we'll be able to do that are completely unimaginable today um and i guess i've been um reading a bit about transhumanism i don't know if you two are familiar with it oh i heard a little bit about it i think you've told me about some of the stuff yeah yeah but it's kind of uh i mean i don't know much about it at all i've kind of just stumbled on the topic but there's um sort of three aims and it's super longevity uh, yeah. super well-being and, and super intelligence um, and it gets all kind of like science fictiony, crazy, altering the genome to uh, hopefully abolish suffering in the future without being extinct. Um, and it sounds kind of crazy. Uh, this guy, could David Pierce, talks about it a lot. But really, I mean, I can't see any. I think it's I think it's theoretically possible that we could create a world that's orders of magnitude better than the one we live in today. We could if humans weren't such bastards. <laughs> 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 unfortunately millions if not billions of people on this planet i just don't believe are willing i be, i don't believe they're willing to create this world that that we want where there is ultimate well-being i i just see humans as an oppressive species and i don't know i just don't think we would have an easy time convincing many people on this planet to um adopt a peaceful way of life that would Exactly. That's the, that's what I think as well because we're a minority and uh, yeah, you know we're surrounded by by people who who do not care who do not care about others suffering and uh, yeah. So that's why I do not have hope anymore, and that's why I'm a little bit <laughs> pessimistic. So, Jack, taking into account um, some of the stuff. Laith has said there about like antinatalism and stuff. What what is it that you find particularly unrealistic about the message? If you also like, because people are telling you, Jack, you're being unrealistic about the stopping wild animal suffering. Why would you then say that maybe antinatalism is and and the living on Mars and all this other stuff like what is antinatalism not more realistic than say stopping a wild animal suffering or so maximum it, well-being and stuff like that it comes down to the the argument from selection pressure again it's just mm. that if we decide, decide to stop having children even if 0.5% of the population want to have children their genes will continue through the gene pool and ours won't so I, I, you, I'm assuming that you guys have kind of, or Leith has heard of this argument before. I mean, what, what do you think about it? Yeah, but that's the same when someone talks about uh, veganism. Like, like if you stop consuming animal products, 0.5% of the population will continue to do that. I don't see it, it, it as being the same because I'm just talking about selection pressure. So if I, you know, if we all, if, if, if we stop having children, our genes don't continue, but anyone who decides to have children, their genes continue, and we're basically just eliminating all of the people who don't want to have children. Whereas with, with veganism, it's not related to 
the propagation of genes. But still, if if we were to promote antinatalism more and more and more, but like antinatalism, like is something that's not very much heard of at all. Like, in fact, I don't know anyone who's even heard of antinatalism outside the vegan movement. If it were to be promoted more heavily and more people sort of took it on, that would surely pave the way as much as veganism would towards a world where fewer and fewer people would procreate. Yes, there still would be people continuing to procreate, but that just means, you know, kids are going to be in need of adoption and, you know, antinatalism doesn't hold any stance against adopting children. So I, yeah, I, I see it as a similar thing to, to veganism and, you know, the things like, and even in veganism, you say that we shan't, we shouldn't breed uh, domesticated animals. We, are against buying from breeders and pet shops. So I think they link in the same way, surely. There are, I mean, there are links there in analogous situations, I guess. And I agree that it's good to, I think it's good to promote antinatalism because it's good to get people actually considering whether having children is the right thing to do because I think most people don't really <laughs> ask these questions yeah. uh, before, they have, before they have children. And um, you said, Jack, sorry, that you were a soft antinatalist is the way you would describe yourself. Would you also describe yourself as a soft anti-breeder if it came to dogs? Or would you just say you're hardline against dogs being bred? I'm against dogs being bred. Are you a soft anti-breeder, though? <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason, the reason I call myself a soft antinatalist is because I don't want the extinction of the human race. Like, antinatalists do but why then do you not want the extinction of dogs like bless them i love dogs and all but why would you not want the extinction of human race but you but you do want the extinction of dogs presumably i know which one i'd choose to keep around if i could choose if i had to choose between the two well i don't want the extinction of the human race because i think that we have the capacity to make the world better for the other sentient beings who live here yeah um, whereas you know people's pet dogs they're they're not going to i mean they can create a better world just by being cute i guess <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But they're, they're not they're not going to help wild animals mm. do, do you see Leith, uh an inconsistency there between like when when people say that it's wrong to breed a dogs but it's not wrong to breed the human animal or do you think it's separate from veganism i think it's separate from veganism because 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 breeding humans in the first place uh, would definitely harm other animals, whether it's um, in in an indirect way or in a direct way. Yeah. Like when you walk down the street, you step on ants without knowing, and and <laughs> you're causing suffering to other animals. That's just by walking down the street. So. How about if you use airplanes, for example, or if you use other stuff? Because you're in the you're in a consumer at the end, and you're consuming resources, and the resources on this planet are limited. So you're taking this from someone else, and you're harming someone else. Even if you live a vegan life, even if uh, you're vegan since you're born, you're still harming others. So that doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, but so you wouldn't say. If someone was vegan, but they decided to procreate, you wouldn't say that's a violation of vegan values in any way, or would you? It is a, a violation of vegan values because you're still, even if, even if you're, you cannot guarantee that your child is going to be vegan. Yeah. Even if you raise him on veganism, you cannot guarantee that. How can you guarantee that 100%? How can you guarantee that he has the same intentions that you have? And he has the same personality where, where he loves to preach veganism or he loves to do that. It might be uh, the opposite. And that's what happens to a lot of vegans, by the way. They breed children and then they uh, get frustrated of what's happening. Mm. So, Jack, they I expect mean, something else. Yeah. For, for as long, Jack, as like, we don't have these um, transhumanism things that that you'd like to see implemented and like, you know, the super well-being and stuff like that. And for as long as we don't have a vegan world, do you think it can be ethical for humans to continue to procreate while we don't have these things? Yeah, it's, it's really tough. Um, as I said, I don't, I don't feel justified bringing someone into the world and potentially having an, 
maybe an indefinite chain of human beings being brought into the world, some of which are likely to have terrible, terrible lives. I don't feel justified in doing so. But at the same time, I also have this, this feeling that I described earlier where I feel like, wow, we, are, we, are, we have developed the cognitive capacity to actually start making this world better. And all of the suffering that's been going on mm. since time began, we have the potential to actually start shaping the world to make it more compassionate. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of stuck in between an area where I, I feel like I don't want to create beings that, that can suffer but at the same time, I want the human race to continue and to continue developing morally as we have done so that one day we can make the world better for all sentient beings and not just for us. Mm. But aren't, are, they, but, are we then uh, so, not using... So, Go on, Leith. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I have a question for Jack here. Like, like what's better than not existing? What's better than resting in peace without having any needs? What's better than that, like... So what's the point of making it better for the next generations? Because well, when we say better, I'd say less suffering is better, but you're saying, uh, is this a hypothetical based on the fact that we could all be not existing? Yeah, exactly. I, I mean that the best thing is to not exist in the first place, to, to not have needs, to not have wants, mm -hmm. to to not ask for anything, to not feel pain, to not feel, to not have nervous systems in the first place, because mm. the problem is with the nervous system, because it, it, it gives you, it, it allows you to feel pain and suffer. So by not having this, that's the best thing in, in my opinion. So why do you think that it, what's better than that is to keep humans and to continue this life? Well, I guess the, the point I was making, it's just that I also care about the suffering experienced by the wild animals and we are the only ones who have the ability to make it better for them. Yeah. Um, but what's better than non-existence, I think, is, is a not a net positive life, a, a life that, let's say, theoretically, we haven't got suffering, we've just got well-being, we've just got pure happiness and bliss. Um, I think that would be pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. But the thing is, all the generations of humans that you create in between are essentially pawns in a game, right? You're essentially using humans who definitely will suffer between now and this utopian goal. Surely you're pushing out more humans into existence who will suffer and cause animal suffering for some goal that you might not even know will happen. Do you not think? Well, the suffering will continue indefinitely unless we continue to exist, though. I mean, how would you guys feel about pressing a button to eliminate human beings, but only human beings? Mm. Yeah, I think I'd press that. What do you think, really? Leif? Yeah. Um, if, if this is the only option and I do not have the other button to yeah. eliminate all suffering, then I would go for that. Yeah. Because you wow, could at okay. least eliminate domesticated animal suffering and human animal suffering. But the majority of, of suffering on the planet isn't in human human beings. And it's, we could Yeah. And we we are the only ones who can actually do something about the misery that exists. But I think we cause the highest intensity of suffering, more than any other creature. I don't think any other creature outputs the same intensity of suffering that humans do. Like no other creature yeah. is looking up pigs and stuff in, in those crates. It, it depends. I mean, like some animals, there are ways to die that seem incredibly bad, like being eaten alive by parasites. You know, there's lots of suffering in the wild that is very intense. Now, I'm not sure you can get more yeah. intense than being like chased and, and eaten alive, that kind of thing. Yeah, but the way I see those things are those are momentary bits in an otherwise not great, but sort of OK life. For most farms and farmed animals in the world, it's just day in, day out, pure suffering, confinement. They can't even move. Mm. Like, I, I would personally rather be born a zebra than be born a factory farm chicken or pig. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, if you were born a wild animal, the, like, it's, you know, over 99% chance, when you're like 99.9% .9 chance that you'd just be born as a baby and then starve or be eaten by a predator or your mother <laughs> um, like within the first few days of, of birth. 
So, I mean, it, overall, it'd be less suffering than, say, a factory farm pig who's going to be in a crate for six months or something, you know? Yeah. Um, it's just that the scale of suffering in the wild is so incredibly unimaginable. It's unfathomable. And I just, I'd, I mean, do you not have any moral uncertainty where you, there's a chance, you must know there's a chance you're pressing that button and you're condemn, condemning animals to suffering it like eternally when you, when, when we could actually do something about it one day? I would see it as not pressing that button is condemning domesticated animals to suffering eternally. That's the way I look at it. It's that if I don't press that button to eliminate humankind, I'm essentially saying, again, this is the pessimist in me, I'm essentially saying I am happy for oppression to continue forevermore. Because humans are the only species that oppress. And I'm sorry, Jack, I just can't ever see humans not oppressing in some way. But you're, they're, they're, they're not even, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. They're not even good to each other. Like until now, there's sexism, there's homophobia, there's s slavery in some countries. Uh, exactly. Until now, I mean, and like we are improving, we have improved a lot and we're, the trajectory is up in terms of improving well-being for human beings. Mm. I just feel like if you were, if you were to press that button, you're ignoring the vast majority of suffering. But then would you, Jack, press the, the button to wipe out wild animals, but not humans? I mean, I have, I have a lot of moral uncertainty when people ask me these questions about pressing buttons to wipe, wipe out species, because I just, there's people who are much more intelligent than me who would think that this is incredibly wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't know. Um, if I'm being completely honest, that with what I know about how bad how bad the suffering can be in the wild i i'd probably i'd probably be committed to to pressing it yeah and obviously we don't have this button so all this button talk is purely hypothetical but what can us three do asap to stop to to uh lower wild animal suffering like what can we do because obviously this is a question you've been getting a lot jack with all these videos and stuff that you're putting out and the main question you're getting is, yeah, Jack, sounds great, but what are you going to do about it? What, like, what is it that we can actually do? Yeah, yeah, good question. I mean, as I said, I've got a video that I'm working on at the moment to go into approaches to reducing wild animal suffering. And I can't emphasize enough the fact that this area is so neglected. Yeah. But it doesn't really make sense to, as a criticism to say, well, we've got no solutions before we've actually tried to find any. But as individuals... Oh, one of the things we can do is to raise awareness about wild animal suffering. As I said, people tend to romanticize the lives of wild animals. When we think of a wild animal, we think of beautiful elephants playing in the, in the river because that's what we saw on David Attenborough's documentaries, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, one of the, the best things we can do right now is to raise awareness because even if we envisage a future where we have the technology to make an incredible difference to the lives of wild animals, none of that will matter if we don't actually have the desire to help them. If we don't have the desire to do anything about it, then it's pointless. So we need to create a society that cares about wild animals. We need to yeah. encourage people to think about the individual rather than the species, like we often see in conservation. So I guess that is that what you've, you've been doing recently, is, is you're just trying to sort of uh, light the match so to speak you're the one who's just trying to actually get this idea sort of going so that we as a society can actually create this world where wild animals suffer less yeah i'm trying to start a conversation i guess i think yeah. less so than veganism wild animal suffering is more of an academic topic and you need academics conducting research on the lives of wild animals in the most effective ways to help them but you know, there needs to be funding in these areas. There needs to be an interest and yeah. public perception is important. You can't make policy changes without having the public agreeing with you. Um, but another thing we can do, I suppose, is to donate to uh, wild animal suffering charities like Wild Animal Initiative and Animal Ethics. Mm, and I think those are, those are probably the two, uh, the two main things we can do right now. It's sort of, if you can afford it, you can donate some money to help them conduct research and you can certainly raise awareness about wild animals and start talking about animals as individuals and not talking about ecosystems and species as a whole. Yeah. How did that chat you have with, um, oh, I forget the YouTuber's name, um, 
the one who's a foot soldier. Did, did you have a debate with vegan foot soldier recently? Yeah, it must have been a couple of months ago. We, we had a little debate. Um, what was his stance and what, how did the debate go? So he said a, he said a few different things. I think uh, one of the, in one of his, one of his points was that he doesn't feel like we can make things better. He kind of sees uh, the suffering in nature inevitable and there's nothing we can do about it. From my perspective, I don't think we have the evidence to make that claim. We just haven't got the evidence to say confidently either way um, what we can do to help them that we know is going to have a positive effect and what, or, or to make the claim that we can't help them at all. We just don't know. We just haven't got the research to make that claim. Uh, but the other argument he makes um, if I'm remembering correctly, I think he believes that we only have an obligation not to cause harm and we don't have an obligation to reduce harm. Um, from my really? perspective, why did it? Yeah, see, see, I would disagree with him there. Why would we not have an obligation to reduce harm? Well, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I, I don't see a distinction. I do think we have yeah. kind of a, a perpetrator bias where if someone's causing the harm, we feel more strongly about it. Yeah, um, I'm not sure why we've evolved to have that feeling. You know, if there's an animal suffering um, with a disease, and if there's an animal being like stabbed, yeah, um, even if the suffering lies, we feel more emotional about the the animal being stabbed, and we feel angry that someone's causing that pain. 100%. But I think if if we if 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 like me, you ultimately care about suffering, and you think that all suffering matters equally, regardless of who 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 it's who's experiencing it and who's causing it. It's the, it's the negative experience that matters. Then I can't see any reason to say that the, the, the pig being stabbed, that's worse than the pig sort of dying from a disease. If the suffering is the same, I think they matter the same. And I, and as I said before, I think it's a coin toss as to whether we should help one or the other. If we only have the opportunity to help one, they matter equally. Yeah. And Laith, what, what do you think that we could do about wild animal suffering in our daily lives? Because obviously part of ethelism is, is acknowledging that life and existence is harmful and pain is bad. What sort of things can we put into practice? Or is it just a philosophy and there's no real answers, no real solutions to it at the moment? Uh, no, it's not just the philosophy. I agree with Jack that we have to raise awareness and talk to people about it, but uh, that doesn't really help. Like, even if people know about it, we need to do some action. We need to do some progress. And in order to do that, uh, you need to start sterilizing animals in the wild uh, in a painless way, as you said before, if, if there's any possible way to do that. And... Uh, yeah, that's that's how we can at least try as much as possible to uh, start eliminating their suffering. Yeah, but of course we we need more research before we can just go in there and and start sterilizing animals. We don't know how, we don't know whether that could have a negative effect overall because of the other animals that interact with with the species we're sterilizing. I f I feel like we're we're not at the point where we can start implementing large scale interventions. I do agree somehow, yes, because for example, if, if you sterilize all, all deers, then some lions will suffer from hunger. Mm. Uh, but, but yeah, you, you're right. We need to uh, do some research. And the other, th the other thing is um, sort of sterilizing animals en masse. This isn't the sort of campaign that's going to be perceived positively by the general public. I think there's areas we can we can start that are going to be much more positively perceived. You know, we can we can look at areas where perhaps we're already kind of intervening. For instance, um, pests get killed with traps, with poison. Uh, we kill pest animals, animals that we describe as pests in horrible ways. We could perhaps look at researching fertility control on pest animals as an alternative to inhumane death killing you know um, i think there's there's places we can look at that are going to receive much more positive perception and, and I, I try to stay away from saying things like yeah let's go sterilize all the animals or or yeah let's just uh, make them all extinct because these aren't the sorts of things that i think people are going to get behind but at the same time people want solutions though don't they and that this is the main yeah. criticism you've had recently is that it's all like a load of hot air and they're saying, Cumaine Hancock, tell us what we can actually do about this. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so do you not think there should be a radical solution? 
Well, I think I think that there are areas for future research, and hopefully we can implement things on a small scale that can be expanded larger in the future when we have more research. Um, and, and these areas for future research can be looking into contraception. It can be looking into, um, what's the word? Um, ways, what's the word for? Um, uh, sterilization or? Yeah, uh, no, no, no. So, um, oh, vaccinations, <laughs> right. Vac- yeah, we can, yeah, look yeah. At, okay. we can look into things like vaccinations and, and we can yeah. research these things and, and perhaps one day we can really help wild animals but both for the reasons of public perception and for the reasons that we don't really know what we're doing yet. You know, there is a chance that an intervention could do more harm than good. So we, we need to research these things before we just go in and, and start intervening, I guess. Yeah. And um, can you ever see yourself promoting antinatalism in future, Jack? Or do you think that you, that might be a long way away before you do that? I guess um, because antinatalism is quite a controversial topic. Yeah. And there's this kind of this idea that if you say something that people think are crazy, they're less likely to to listen to the other stuff you say. And, and vegans have been telling me this with the wild animal suffering stuff, like, oh my god, this is terrible for veganism. Even if you're right, people are going to think you're crazy and not going to listen to what you're saying about veganism. Yeah. Um, but I guess I, I feel so strongly about wild animal suffering, and I feel like it's so neglected that I kind of feel that it's necessary, even if some people think I'm nutty. I mean, the the like to dislike ratio has been really positive in my wild animal suffering videos, even if the negatives are largely, sorry, even if the comments are largely negative. Um, but yeah, I, I would have a bit of a concern with promoting antinatalism in that I do think some people might think I'm kind of anti-human and, and, a, and a yeah. bit crazy. Um, I mean, I have conversations with people where I try and encourage them to actually think about the topic because I think most people don't, as I said before. <laughs> Um, and like I said, I don't feel justified in bringing a sentient being into the world. And I'm kind of conflicted because I also feel like humans shouldn't be extinct because we are the ones that can make the world better in the future. And we can potentially have a world where humans experience amazing lives with very little to, to nil suffering. So I'm kind of not sure really where, to be honest with you, where I stand on antinatalism at this point. I'm still trying to work all this stuff out, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and Leith, do you think that it's more important that as a species we promote antinatalism or veganism? Which do you think is, or, or do you think that is equally important as each other? I think one leads to the other. Like they're they're related, to be honest. Because, um, for example, when 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 you're a vegan, you're an antinatalist for farmed animals because yeah. you do not contribute to breeding these animals for human consumption. That's a so great point. You stop, you stop funding people to do that. You stop breeding these animals because we know in uh, farmed animals, like millions of animals are breeded every single day, maybe yeah. for human consumption. So, so they're so related. And uh, I think they're both very important. It's, it's yeah. very important to have both at the same time, to be both at the same time. Because I criticize antinatalists who are uh, carnists, and I criticize vegan I've never breeders met at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, every, every antinatalist I've ever um, met is vegan. There's a lot of antinatalists who, who unfortunately are not vegan. Yeah. And that does not make sense to me. It's uh, hypocritical. Yeah. Same I'm... goes for vegan breeders. That's how I see it. I th- because uh, yeah. it's an ethical position that you should be taking. And going back to what you were saying a moment ago, is it not weird when a lot of when vegans who aren't antinatalists, when they say something like, oh, antinatalism is crazy, they don't realize that they're actually an antinatalist with regards to however many hundred species that humans are, are breeding for the purpose of food and clothing and stuff like that. It's just like they're kind of arbitrarily picking humans as one species that it's okay to procreate but then all the others they would they don't want to to breed like they're an antinatalist even with regards to dogs and cats exactly yeah that's how i see it if you're against suffering you should be against suffering for everyone you shouldn't uh 
force someone into existence because of your selfish uh, reasons you can adopt instead you have alternative all right so yeah. i'll just ask each of you to a final question before we we end the podcast um jack what would you say to someone who said to you um right now that this wild animal suffering thing that you're banging on about like recently is like a bit of a pipe dream and we need to be focusing more on domesticated animals instead yeah i mean i would say I understand your concerns and um, I'm not for one minute, I'm not suggesting that people should shift their focus. If you're working with farmed animals, I'm not saying you should shift your focus away onto wild animals. I think that it makes sense to focus on farmed animals right now because we really, I really expect that we can create a, a vegan Western world, certainly within our lifetime. So I'm sympathetic to, to what people are saying, but what I would say to them is that, you know, what is it, what is it they really care about? Do you just care about farmed animals or do you care about animals in general? Do you care about sentient beings in general? Because the reason I'm talking about this is because I care about suffering. I care about the negative experiences that sentient beings are forced to feel. I care about the involuntary suffering. And because I care equally about a farmed animal suffering as I do about a wild animal suffering, I, you know, I've thought about this a lot. I can't find any reason to say that we should simply allow the wild animals to continue to suffer. And it doesn't take anything away. It doesn't have to take anything away from farmed animals to also care about wild animals. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say that. <laughs> yeah. And Laith, um, just before we end, what would you say to, um, to all vegans out there about why they should, as well as being vegan, be uh, both an antinatalist and an ethylist? Yeah, I would say that the only guaranteed way to eliminate suffering is to be an ethylist and to be an antinatalist. Uh, because as I mentioned before, no one asked to be born, no one asked to be here. And by being born and by being alive, you suffer, uh, even if nobody is inflicting this pain on you. So by being that this is the only guaranteed way because veganism is about reducing suffering as possible but it's not about pure and all right well thanks very much both for coming on the show that ends the uh, episode two of the carnas and debunk podcast thanks for listening everyone i'd love to hear your thoughts so on the youtube video please drop your comments below what do you think of antinatalism? What do you think of ethylism? What can we do about wild animal suffering? And do you think that as vegans, we should be focusing on these issues? Do you think they relate to veganism in any way? Let us hear your thoughts. And yeah, thanks again, guys, for joining us. And we'll see you again next episode.